All right. So uh, the the uh, this part of like in this part of lecture we we uh, start introducing the basic concepts uh, uh, for Markov decision processes, uh, uh, which require the formalization of concepts that we've been already discussing. So uh, we are uh, starting out with uh, considering a, a set of discrete states, uh, which belong to some set of cardinality S here on the right, uh, a set of actions, uh, which is again, uh, has a fixed cardinality. Uh, so these are discrete actions. Again, there is no uh, specific uh, uh, fundamental difficulty in extending to continuous states and actions, mm, in the sense that uh, the difficulties that arise with continuous state and action also arise when your discrete states uh, space are very, very large. So there's no actually need to uh, accept for, for technical reasons to, uh, to treat them uh, differently. Uh, and one key uh, ingredient in uh, uh, defining the mark of decision process is that uh, the dynamics uh, through state through the space of states is described by a transition probability, which is given here, uh, and it expresses uh, uh, the probability that uh, uh, starting from a state S and taking the action A, the system ends up in a state S prime. Okay, uh, so. Uh, it's useful from the beginning to uh, introduce uh, a graphical description of this process, which I'm putting down here. Uh, so you I have a it? general question about yes, the Markov decision. So th this process are memoryless because the the models or the system we are studying are memoryless, memoryless, or because it's really hard to implement the memory as a part of the of the system. Okay, very good question. Uh, so uh, in, in the following, we will assume for now that the system is truly memoryless in this state space, okay? Uh, it's, it's, this means in general that often in order to, for this assumption to be true, your state space should be very, very large, okay? And uh, this is of course a difficulty. Uh, you can, uh, treat your system as if it were Markovian, but in the sense that you use this Markov assumption as a model of your system, which is not Markovian itself. But we are not discussing this now because this will fall into the, uh, the process of moving from the upper right bottom, uh, upper right side of our uh, diagram down to the situation where we have limited observability because one source of non-Markovianity is limited observability. So we will discuss this separately. Thank you for the point. Uh, so, uh, yeah, other questions? No. Uh, so one, one way to, to graphically represent this uh, information is that to think of your system as a, a, a set of states, which you can depict by circles, okay? Uh, so these are my states, uh, state one, state two, state three. Uh, and then uh, from each state, I can take uh, a sequence, uh, um, a series of a set of possible actions. Okay, for instance, from state one, I could take action one and action two. And if I take action one, I might end up, for instance, with a certain probability here or with a certain probability here. And this probability would be the probability of ending up in S1, given that I started in S1 and I took action A1. And here would be the probability of ending in S2, given the start in S1 and the action A1, okay? And so on and so forth. You can have several of those. And you can imagine a whatever complicated graph, okay? With several actions here i'm using the same actions okay. and you can fill in all the quantities that you want and in these graphs there might be terminal states you see eventually all this process ends up in uh, s2 which might be a terminal state so everything dies in that state or there might be situations when everything is recurrent it moves around uh, restlessly okay 
So it's useful to keep in mind this idea of a, a, a graph of a Markov decision process. Okay, but we were listing our, our ingredients. Uh, so we had states, actions, we have transition probabilities. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, so far, okay, uh, we've been describing a Markov decision process, but uh, uh, we are lacking still a fundamental ingredient in what we've been putting in so far, in the sense that uh, this idea is that we want to uh, control this process. That is, we want to make decisions here that affect what's coming after. And one way of doing this is uh, uh, to introduce the notion of a policy. So what is a policy? A policy is a, a probability distribution over actions. Actually, it's not one probability distribution, but it's a class of probability distributions. That is, what is a policy? From every state, you decide how much probability you want to give to the two actions. So how much weight you put here. So you, you may want to, uh, uh, to put it here, like the weight you put on this action, not this one, the way you put the weight you put on these actions is the probability of picking action one given state one. And the one that you put here, maybe smaller, is the probability of taking action two when you are in state S1. Okay. This is called the policy. And uh, it's important to realize from the very beginning that this part of the problem, that is the way you transition from one state to another. Okay, so this is the policy. But this other part, which is the transition probability, which is what is encoded in these arrows, they are very different from each other. This one is not in control of the environment, of the agent. Okay, the agent has no control on this. Once you take an action, what will happen is not in your hands anymore. It's a consequence of your, of the way you're done as an agent, of the way the robot is done and the way the environment is. The environment can also change by itself in a way that doesn't depend on actions, okay? This is also included. The environment can be dynamic, even if you, Take whatever action you take, the environment can change and you can have no control on that at all. On the other hand, this part here of the policy, of the policy this is something over which you have control. And the goal will be to find out the best policy, but best policy with respect to what? So we still have to define central thing in our uh, problem, which is to define the goal. And in order to define the goal, we have to add something here to this uh, description. We have to add the, some other ingredient in the, term, in, the, in, the, in the form of uh, something which is known as reward. Okay, we have to introduce rewards. So what are rewards? Well, in the general case, uh, we can introduce them uh, here. So we can tweak our transition probability in order to uh, add uh, to each of these steps, the probability of going to a certain location and receiving a certain reward. When you think about reward, the easiest thing to think about them is just think about money, okay? So I am I am as in a certain position S, okay? Which might be, for instance, my bank account or my series of assets. And then I take an action A, which might be buy or sell something. 
And in, in the process, I end up in a new state, which is my assets have changed. My bank account has increased, decreased, depending on what I got in the process. So the action is the choice of what kind of investment you do. And the reward is the immediate gain that you get in this single step, okay? So this notion of reward is very important. So let me uh, put it here. Rewards, uh, or more generally, they are also called uh, reinforcement signals. Okay, because in animal and human behavior, these are not necessarily rewards in the, in an obvious sense, but these are more uh, uh, abstract. Okay, uh, and uh, uh, so rewards uh, are immediate. gratifications, if you wish. And as we will see in a second, these are not necessarily the goal themselves, okay, in reinforcement learning. But rewards are important. So how do they enter in my uh, graph? Well, it means just that every time that I make a transition, okay, in on top of this, there is a certain probability of getting some reward R. Okay, so here you get some reward R, you get some other reward R. So every, every one of those is different, potentially different. These rewards are real numbers, okay? Rewards are real numbers. One dimensional feedback from the system, which is telling you how good you're doing in the process. So for instance, the rewards in, uh, uh, in our bandit problems are what you get once you pull the arm. This is the obvious and immediate uh, interpretation. In uh, the navigation task in the grid world is uh, how much dust you collect if you move to another point, okay? So remember the graph for the uh, for the grid world, okay, you are in a state S, which is your uh, green dot here. Okay, so this is your initial state S. Uh, then you take uh, an action. So suppose that this is the action you take, and if you took take that, then uh, you end up in a new state uh, here which are, is in your new status prime. And uh, is there any dust in uh, that tile? No, no dust. Therefore, you take uh, reward equals zero. And then move around. And if you were here, for instance, if your robot was here and it took a move down and therefore it ended here, sorry, I don't want to touch the screen. Then in this case, the reward would be say one. Or if it goes to the charger, maybe the reward is 10 because it's charging, whatever. You decide how to attribute this. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, Notice that in this case, the transition probabilities, the one that I was described, were very simple because we are not, we're saying that in this case, the robot, if it wants to go west, it will go west. But the MDP also accounts for situations in which uh, uh, it wanted to go west or to go east, but it turned out that it goes sideways also. Okay, This is also included in this kind of algorithms, even if we didn't discuss that. Okay. So actions, uh, it's important to uh, realize that actions have to be interpreted as, uh, as intentions. This is what the agent wants to do, but S prime is the actual outcome. Okay. 
So the agent is in a given state, has the intention of moving to another state, for instance, which may or may not result in doing that. This is the this distinction between the intention and the outcome. Okay. Apart from all this uh, lexicon, which is uh, at the same time useful and sometimes confusing, uh, the definitions, uh, mathematical definitions, are crystal clear. Okay. So uh, this basically uh, is the last ingredient we need because once we have the rewards, we can define our goal. And the goal is to, uh, I will write it explicitly and then we, we discuss it together. The goal is to maximize the cumulative reward in the future over policies. Okay, so maximize, when I say maximize, I, I always have to specify over which, over which kind of variables I maximize. And here the parameters that I, I can use to maximize are the policies. And the second important distinction is that I want to maximize the cumulative reward. So I don't want to maximize what I get immediately, not necessarily. I might be interested in some long-term goal. Of course, if you're interested in some long-term goal, that's where planning comes into the game, okay? So if you have a navigation task and you say, okay, my goal is to go from Trieste to Udine, okay? Then the route that you want to take as the one is the one that tries to optimize over these possible routes. But if you want to go with a shorter horizon and say oh, you care only about the distance you make in five minutes, then maybe you take another route, which is faster, but doesn't take you exactly where you wanted in the first place. So it's important to distinguish between these short term and long term goals. Because the strategies are, will, will be different. If you have a short-term goal, you will do things that are different from you if you have a long-term goal. I don't need that to explain to you because you are here. And if you are here, it's clearly because you are not optimizing over a short-term goal because otherwise we would be sitting in the sun. You're optimizing over, over some kind of long-term goal, which might be different for each of you, but it's certain long-term, okay? Certainly longer than these two hours. Okay, so what is, actually, what does it actually mean, maximize uh, over the cumulative reward? We have to make it precise. And uh, to this uh, uh, aim, we introduce an object which is called the return, which in fact is the averaged return. So its definition is that it's the expectation over a sum which extends in the future. Okay, so starting from any given state, you look into your future. Okay, so bear with me. If you are still asking questions, how can I possibly do that? We will answer to this. But you look into the future, into what will happen in the future, and you want to maximize this object let me write it like this and then i will explain what what this is okay so <clears throat> remember what is happening here in this uh, uh, in this process every time that you take an action according to a given policy a given strategy, distribution of actions, uh, you collect a reward. And then you repeat that again, and then maybe you take the same action or you take another one and you collect a different reward. And you move around in this space uh, state by picking actions and collecting rewards. This object here is the sum of all possible rewards. This is one possible form of it, okay? This is one form, which is the discounted, 
I will explain what this is in a second. Or there is the finite horizon form, which is maximize the sum from t from zero up to a certain time t of your rewards along the way, undiscounted. So the, the, this expression below is probably the most intuitive one. You say, you decide, I have, my time horizon is capital T steps. I want to optimize over the time, which is 10 days, 10 years, 10 minutes. And I decide this beforehand, and this is gonna be my horizon. And then I ask, what is the best policy in order to do to achieve this result. Now, as you can imagine, one important thing is that if you set yourself a fixed horizon, your strategy will change over time. Okay. So suppose that you say, I have to turn in my homework in 10 days. And then what will you do? Okay, you will do nothing on day one, you will do nothing on day two, you will do nothing on day three. And then when in the, on days eight and nine, you will do everything, okay? So typically, if you have a finite horizon, the best strategy is actually to do something different in time. On the other hand, when you use the discounted version, which is the one on the top, you, we will see that you have stationary strategies over time. So the best strategy is the same irrespective of when you start. So what is this uh, discounted uh, uh, thing that, that we have here? So this object uh, here, this parameter here, gamma, is called the discount factor. It's typically comprised between uh, uh, zero and one. Uh, with equality under certain conditions, but now let me state it uh, like this. Uh, it expresses a very simple idea, uh, which is the same idea of the time horizon. Uh, so for instance, let's consider the situation when gamma is zero. If gamma is zero, there is only one term in the sum. Okay, so this quantity here, which we often call G, this thing here, this sum, So G becomes just the first term. So you're only interested in R1 in this case. So this is the situation where you are very myopic uh, and uh, you focus on immediate gratification. On the contrary, when gamma tends to one, it means that you're taking a sum which has a very, very long contribution from times which are very far in the future. So in this case, it's a situation where you are looking ahead a lot into the future. And this is what makes it a long-term goal. Notice that in, in many situations like navigation, the goals are long-term because in order to reach a point, you have to go through a desert of uh, gratification, okay? So it, there will be nothing for you for ages until you get to the final reward. So planning is always something which requires uh, long-term goals rather than immediate gratifications. Okay, so this discount factor is something that you can easily interpret it by saying, uh, if I get a reward, uh, Tomorrow, it's gonna to be more valuable than if I get a reward uh, the day after tomorrow. And the way this gamma uh, is close to one says basically how fast you go uh, towards uh, zero. Basically, everything that happens at times uh, T, which are much larger than one over one minus gamma doesn't count, okay? So this series here is exponentially cut off at times which are larger than this. So this also can be called also the horizon. It plays a similar role to this capital T, only in a different way. 
it's a sort of more smoothed version of a hard uh, deadline. Okay, so uh, clearly this object here that we want to optimize depends on the policy because the choice of the actions affects the choice of the rewards. And therefore, uh, it makes sense to ask how to maximize this thing uh, with respect to policies. So formally, this expectation depends on the P's and on the pies. But remember that we can only act on this. So that's the only set of parameters over which we can optimize. Okay. So this is basically uh, the, the formal setting for Markov decision processes. So the next question that comes in the line is uh, how we do, do we solve them? So is it possible to given all this information, so you as a planner, as a decider, you are given this information. So these transition probabilities, you can choose your policies. One of these two is your objective. How do you compute the optimal policy? What are the properties of this policy? How is, does it look like? Is it random? Is it deterministic? Okay. So all of these questions we will address in the next lecture, starting to set up all the machinery that uh, will lead us to uh, introduce uh, this notion of optimality equations and how to use them for planning. Okay. So that's gonna be it for today. If you have questions, uh, please, Come forward. I have one. Yes, please. Uh, I'll open the camera. Um, I've seen in many, um, well, everywhere basically that the gamma has to be lower than one, uh, which makes sense when our episode can be infinite. That makes sense. Uh, but in practice, I've seen that when you have a time horizon, so let's say a game that after a certain number of steps ends, uh, in many applications actually set to one, but in literature, I never found this, uh, or at least myself, I never found um, anyone explicitly saying that gamma can be equal to one, which again would make sense in this case, because if we're playing a game, the reward is we're winning or losing and uh, we just care about the eventual reward. Okay. Um, gamma can definitely be one in two situations. So one is this, the one that I'm writing here below. So you see, I could, I could have added the gamma here uh, in the finite horizon case as well. And sometimes people do, they can combine the two. There is no particular uh, restriction. What is important is that as long as you put uh, uh, hard horizon, your optimal solution will be generically be time dependent. Okay. And if you seek for stationary policies, it, it can only be approximately optimal. So that's, that's one formal thing to say. Uh, another thing is that you can actually put gamma to one in uh, uh, the situation above where you were when your uh, sum extends uh, infinitely into the future if your Markov process has some absorbing state, like in this case here. So if there's some absorbing state, you can put gamma equals to zero because with probability one, your system will end there. So as long as when you're there, you get no final reward. So all the transitions here don't, don't give any additional reward. Okay. Then you can uh, set uh, easily gamma to, to one. Which means- Yeah. Which means that if you don't know the MDP, then you cannot do it. You must know the MDP. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And so I, I also should add that uh, uh, there is a way to take the limit of gamma tending to one in order to describe uh, processes which are stationary. Uh, so it makes sense also to think about gamma not being set to one, but approaching one uh, uh, in a limit. So all these things are uh, 
I think uh, they are very well described in, uh, in uh, Sutton and Bartos book, uh, uh, in which they describe all, all the possible combination of these counting factors. Uh, these two these two approaches stand out. The one that I that I wrote here stand out for their theoretical simplicity because in the first case, uh, in second case, uh, this will be the key for us to do what is called dynamic programming. That is starting from the end of the episode and building up the optimal solution by going backwards in time, which is one important key. And the second one is important because this particular form of time discounting by team, by means of these geometrical factors. Uh, is the one that is key to uh, writing down an optimality equation that doesn't depend on time itself. So everything will be invariant under time translations in the first setting. So this is for because of these very nice uh, uh, properties, we will uh, insist on this. But of course, you can mix up the two. You can do approximate stuff. Uh, that's that's for sure. Okay. Thanks. Sure. Any other question? Okay. So if not, I have uh, a question. Oh, yeah, sorry. here, please. So I, I have two questions. First is uh, I don't know if it makes sense to see it as uh, the average as the it's like a present value of the just like in finance. Uh, so th this average has to be thought in the following way. So uh, if you find yourself Operationally, operationally, how would you uh, compute this? Uh, suppose you find yourself in state S1, and then you start doing things according to a certain policy. So you choose a policy, that is, you choose the probability distribution for the things you want to do next, the actions. And then you start doing a Monte Carlo, in the sense that you pick an action according to this probability, and you observe the new state, and then you pick another action, then you observe a new state, okay? So graphically, what you do is another way. Uh, this gives me the opportunity to introduce another graphical description. So if you are if you are in a certain state S at time zero, you use your policy to extract an action at time zero, and then these two together through your P will send you to a new state S one, and in the process you will observe a reward. R1, and then you repeat. Okay, so this is uh, how you write this process in the form of a temporal graph. Okay, so suppose you start here and then you just uh, do a Monte Carlo and then you simulate and you will see what you observe and you collect your data, you, you sum, and then you repeat again, again, and again, and again, all this. And this sum of Monte Carlo objects will converge to this expectation. Okay. The point is that uh, this procedure of doing things by Monte Carlo is very expensive. So you want actually to know what happens in the future without ex explicitly simulating it. How this is possible? Well, we will have to wait for tomorrow. You had another question? I just want to understand more okay. why why we have the discount factor. Um, aside from the fact that you mentioned that it gives a good property that what you have is time invariant. Is that the only reason why? Okay, so there are two reasons. One, one uh, broad reason is that uh, it, uh, it introduces one way of thinking uh, about uh, how far into the future you are interested in. Okay, so uh, this is the first thing. And the second thing, in general, you could have added uh, different ways of discounting. So this function gamma to the power t is one particular choice, which has this nice property, okay, which is called, uh, uh, which is actually a consequence, if you want, of the fact that the geometric distribution here, so these geometric factors are the equivalent of the exponential distribution. And the exponential distribution is memoryless. And that's why this object doesn't depend on time. So this is the technical reason. Uh, it's important to, to note that uh, uh, psychological experience with humans have shown that uh, humans do not use this kind of discounting. So they, they discount in a much slower way. 
sort of a hyperbolic rather than uh, exponential decay of this counting, uh, which is very interesting uh, from the viewpoint of uh, psychology and uh, neuroscience. So one, might, one could be interested in changing this kind of discount uh, factor in the future. And there's a lot of work uh, taking place between decision making and neuroscience on that. Uh, but the calculations become cumbersome. Uh, and uh, for the purpose of clarity of the explanation, I will stick to these two uh, settings. Okay, thank you. I have another small question about the, the rewards. So for now, what we said is that the reward is simply a real number, a positive, re well, it's a real number, and it is associated with, uh, because I, I would have just said in a, without knowing before, I would have said that, that we think of it as a function. But for now, we just say it's a number and it's associated with uh, uh, couples of uh, okay. um, I, I think I, I, think I, I think I get what, what you're aiming at. So let me let me try and uh, anticipate you and answer yeah. to, to this. Uh, so I've, I've been saying that there is a probability distribution which generates rewards and new states. So actually, this is a probability density with respect to R, but uh, allow me to be here. Uh, what we will do tomorrow, and we will introduce uh, an object, which is uh, uh, the expected value of R given S and A, which is the integral of all possible R's of of R, P of R, S prime, sum over S prime of S A, which we will also define with the slight abuse of notation as R of S A. Now probably I am not going to put this, so it's going to be even better. The second, I don't want to mix, mix, mess up with the notation now. So let's put this aside and uh, let's use this. Okay. So uh, these R's in general are random variables, which can be experienced at every time you move from a state to another state through an action. Uh, but uh, in the process of optimization, since you are interested only in averages here, it's useful to introduce this conditional average. And we will call this as the average rewards. So basically, the point is that given a state, a starting state, an action, and an ending state, even we, if we know all of them, in theory, the reward could still be different. But then we take an average of this. Exactly. So okay. The distribution yeah, no, no, okay. of rewards may vary. Rewards may be stochastic. Uh, but in solving the planning problem, we will already be interested in this object. And so in this sense, this is a function because it's a function of the triplet S, A, S prime that you're visiting along the way. Right. Otherwise, we should think of it as a distribution, basically. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Which is something that you don't. Yeah, OK. <laughs> OK, okay. thanks. Yeah. Uh, can I also ask about the reward? Yes, please. Uh, so maybe we can, we can also think of our reward as like, like the opposite of our reward that we want to optimize. We want to minimize. So for example, if there is an error and we want to sure. minimize it. Sure, sure, I think I get it. So uh, <clears throat> yeah, so the, the basic idea is that the, the, the rewards, okay, uh, you, you, we tend to think in the decision-making uh, context uh, in terms of rewards, which are positive, uh, they could be negative. So a reward which is negative is sort of, uh, loosely speaking, a punishment, even though uh, it's a bit of an overstretch of a definition because in animal behavior, positive and negative uh, rewards uh, are actually differently perceived, but nevertheless. So you can think also in terms of what you're saying, uh, if you reverse rewards, then you would have costs, okay? So 
in uh, in everything that follows uh, it's uh, sufficient to put a minus in order to switch from uh, rewards to cost okay so you can formulate all these things in terms of costs uh, everything uh, i do something i get a penalty and then I, I want to optimize in order to reduce this penalty which might be an error or whatever is that what you're asking for yeah so it's absolutely symmetric in uh, in the following even though like i told you uh there are situations in which there is a difference between uh, plus and minus signs, but this is something more about neuroscience than uh, the mathematics of decision. And can you give an overview or like tips on how to choose the correct gamma between zero to one? Okay. In your real life, you mean, or <laughs> when? Yeah. Just choosing the gamma means that it depends very much on what, what kind of, uh, uh, of objective you are, right? Uh, so for instance, uh, let's go to the nav navigation task. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, let's suppose that we are starting, no, let, let, me, let me redraw this again because otherwise it's a mess. I, I keep on uh, drawing on the same graph. So let's go back to the navigation task. Okay, I'm not going to write down the grid. I'm just writing down the fact that we have a, some initial state S. Okay, and the actions are always something which are very localized in, uh, in space. So they can only bring me in a small neighborhood of S. And then I have uh, certain uh, uh, rewards which are displaced around. Okay, so for instance, here there is a reward. Uh, here there is a reward. And here there is a big reward. Okay. Okay, so uh, uh, like I told you, uh, the number one over one minus gamma uh, is uh, essentially the horizon. Okay, so you can expect that if you set gamma, for instance, equals to one half, uh, the only thing you care about on average is what happens over two times. So the typical time you care for is two. Now, uh, if the typical time you care, you care about is two, then uh, what is your optimal strategy of moving around? Well, you will definitely go for the closest reward. So all your policy here would be, oh, go towards that. If you are close to this, well, go towards the closest one. And if you're there, go towards here. But now suppose your horizon is longer and you say you set uh, uh, gamma uh, order of 0 0.1, then your horizon uh, has become uh, nine. Okay, so you have about 10 time step ahead of you to look forward. Then in this case, maybe your strategy would be different because if you are here, you start here, Maybe you, what you would do is just, okay, why don't I collect this first? I'm blue. I collect this first and then I go here. So I take two in a row. And if I'm here, maybe I still have time to do this if I have 10, step, 10 time steps rather than going directly to this. Or maybe I'm gonna do the opposite since this is the biggest one and it's decreasing in time, its value. Maybe I go this way now. So in one of our uh, uh, tutorials, uh, about practical tutorials, we will see exactly this. So how does the choice of the horizon affect the kind of strategies to move around in a navigation problem? Typically, if the horizon is short, you will settle for the immediate closest thing that you get. If your horizon is longer, you can develop more complex strategies and trying around to collect stuff, depending on how valuable it is and how much it will decay. So you, you can imagine that there, are, there is some critical gamma, right? Because uh, uh, suppose that you have two rewards, one is uh, small and one is large. And uh, if your gamma, since both rewards tend to decay in time, uh, you might want to choose one before the other depending uh, their on their relative value and the value of gamma, okay? So depending on your time scale, you might decide, well, I pick this or I pick this first and then maybe the second, depending on 
on how far can I go? Can you get the just the general idea? So it is like an arbitrary parameter. It is a we... parameter which you which you decide at the beginning. Okay. Okay. Uh, it's part of the model of your uh, environment, okay. and it's something which is a decision. It, it decides what shape your goal uh, has. It's not something mm -hmm. that you change over time uh, with the algorithm. It's uh, it's fixed at the outset and there it stays. So the choice of gamma only affects the accuracy? No, no, it affects uh, the strategy. I mean, it's, uh, it's very important. It affects uh, what kind of solutions okay. you find. Okay. okay. The Sorry, uh, yeah. could it be? I'm thinking about this example. So basically, basing on the on the gamma, the agent will decide where to steer toward which uh, reward first, and eventually to go on. But this is always uh, uh, probabilistic, uh, in some sense. It's not deterministic. So could it be that uh, say that we have an agent with a fixed, uh, he make, made up his strategy. And then we uh, are evil uh, uh, manipulators of the environment and we tweak the rewards on this graph so that the agent is like more, uh, uh, is pushed to go toward the big reward but uh, doesn't have enough time to, to reach it. Like, could it be possible tweaking the, the rewards in the environments so that the agent uh, uh, basically the, the agent's strategy breaks because maybe the, the value of the reward is so high that is uh, akin to go towards it even if the time is not sufficient to complete the, like so that the expected reward is uh, uh, suggesting to go that way, but in practice it, it, will, it won't be getting there. Uh, okay, so, um... So uh, let me first clarify if I understand correctly. So when, when you say, I mean, you, you, you are designing a certain structure of the rewards, uh, but you're not changing it over, over time, right? You're just keeping it as it is. It just- Yeah, 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 yeah. Let's say that we design it so that it tricks the okay. agent in- uh... the, reason, the reason I'm asking is because what you were saying looked a little bit like a, an adversarial situation in which you are acting against and, yeah. and since there is an old part of reinforcement learning which deals with the games and adversarial things, I just wanted to be clear that you're not thinking about that. You're yeah, no, no, it's not the dynamics. Like we, we set designing, up this... designing some uh, complex, some tricky environments. Is that, that what you're saying? Yeah, like we, we can choose the environment in the beginning, but then we let the agent uh, okay. go. But, we, for, but we know the time, for example, that he's able to stay alive. Good. So. Uh, what uh, is the fundamental result is that uh, uh, whatever design of the environment you choose, there are algorithms that allow you to compute the optimal solution for that environment given the gammas, etc. Okay, so even if it falls short, that's the best thing that it could do if it does that. Okay, so you are assured about that. Uh, some strategies might seem counterintuitive, but the mathematic doesn't lie. These are the best ones that you can get if you solve the problem correctly. Okay, so basically, um, okay, Sto stochastically, the answer is no, the agent will still do the, the most reasonable thing. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Even though there is a certain probability which might be high or small of missing the target, that's the best thing that you can do on average. Another yeah. thing is that if you change the game, I mean, if you don't, if you don't ask about uh, winning on average, but if you ask other questions like, I want to get uh, this specific uh, reward. With a, with the high reward with a given probability, okay? So you're, you're, you're discussing the situation which is called risk sensitive learning, mm -hmm. which is very interesting in itself. Uh, uh, it also has a very well developed mathematical framework, but we're not discussing this now. Okay, no, it's just out of curiosity. Sure, sure, oh, that's a good question. Thanks. Okay. okay. I think we're really uh, around very late today. Uh, I'm both happy and sorry for this. Uh, happy because of your interest and sorry because uh, I over flooded, overflowed. Uh, but uh, let's, uh, let's call it a day and uh, we meet again tomorrow at nine, okay? Have a nice day.
Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye.